Hey guys, thanks for doing this. So good to see you. Me too, man. This is awesome, dude. Look at this vibe we got here. This, this is, is sort of your vibe matches the shirt, Dan. Like we've got it all going on for you here. It's intentional, man. It's perfect. <laughs> thanks for having us, man. It's good to see you. I want people to know that you guys are in the middle of rehearsals for the tour and you flew here to New York, flying right back to Nashville to do this. So I cannot thank you enough. That's one part of it. Number two, I'm going to put the temperature at 103 in this greenhouse right now. <laughs> It's not the heat that gets you. You know, it's the humidity. <laughs> it's what they say. I read it in a book somewhere. It's so true. I want to thank you doubly for doing this. Of course. So Dan, tell me how rehearsals are going. I mean, you were out on tour for three shows, March of 2020. You're selling out Bridgestone in Nashville. It's about to explode. And then boom, everything stops. It's so crazy, man. I mean, you never expect that to happen. We work our entire lives for this. You know, it's a dream to get to the level. I mean, it's just such rarefied air to get to the place where we can do an arena tour. You know, we've had such great support from everyone around us, our team, our families, our friends, our fans, and you get there, we get a taste of it. Like we're all in. <laughs> I mean, we're looking at MSGs sold out, all these amazing bucket list venues. Then all at once, I mean, the entire world shuts down. And it was just, it got to our heads a little bit, man. You know, I think everybody, I speak for the music industry when, when I say it, it's like, we were all looking around like, do we still have a career? Are we gonna be able to do this? You know, and uh, I, I think the first couple of weeks were sort of shell shock. I remember a lot of pacing around my yard, like just pulling weeds, <laughs> doing all kinds of like odd jobs, landscaping, you know, trying to stay busy. And then I think, you know, after a few weeks of that, it was like, man, we, this is a crazy opportunity that we have. There's, you know, blessing in the sky, silver lining, not being on the road for a year and a half. Like, let's, let's make the most of it. So we made an album and, and now here we are a year and a half later, like with a new album out to the fans. Uh, a couple singles that have gone up the chart, gone to number one, that we've not gotten to play live a single time, which is like, that's the craziest thing well, in the world. Because usually when you have a number one song, or you've got a song at the top of the charts, you're out there feeling it. It's a right. tangible energy from the fans singing it back to you every night. But we just, it's like, do people actually know this song? Is somebody, <laughs> is, is it, I don't know, is somebody playing a prank on us? But yeah. here we are in rehearsals, man, and it's going amazing. We're working new songs into the set, and I think, I, you know, speaking to our artist friends, speaking to everybody, crew, folks out there on the road, it's like the energy is high, fans are ready for it, we've waited long enough, and I think, you know, I, I think it just causes us to, to appreciate the moments a little bit more, you know, usually those rehearsal days are grueling, you know, you're in there at 7 a.m., you're working till past 7 p.m., it's just long, long days, but I think we're all looking around, enjoying it a little bit more, appreciating, you know, the people, the friends that we get to spend the time with, and and then it's all that much more worthwhile when we get out there and feel it on stage, man. We've gotten a few shows under our belts this summer and it's like, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. It's crazy. I had had a baby, our youngest, Ames, he was born two weeks before our Bridgestone shows, which crazy. was just kind of a, a wild thing anyway. And was kind of preparing myself to, you know, see what that looks like having a, a young child on the road. And that was the one big blessing in disguise for, for me and my family was just being able to actually be there. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of, I'm sure if we if we look, we can find a lot of positives. Uh, but at that point, it was just like, man, this is really a terrible situation for everybody. And uh, you know, as the time went on, I think it was a learning curve of everyone, everyone just being like, okay, we're in this. We have to figure this out and, and kind of settle in together. And there was a lot of time. I think the biggest helps were just the community that we have there in Nashville and being able to talk and the technology that we had. You know, being yeah. able to get on Zoom or whatever it was, and to be able to still write songs and to be able to kind of help each other cope, I think. And, you know, Dan and I were always constantly texting of, you know, what's going on? What, what are you doing? 300 like, days to yeah, our next yeah, show. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah. yeah, man, I'm prepared. You know, a lot of people, it was like, you know, working remotely and a lot of people were figuring that out and what that looked like with their jobs. And we're just kind of like, there's, we don't have anything else besides this. You know, we can't get out on the road right now. We, we are forced to, to be in our homes. And for us, that was a, a difficult challenge because we're so used to go, go, go. And we're, you know, preparing for tour and always kind of thinking about tour and can't wait to get out to our fans. And that was just like, all right, you, you have to wait and you have to take right. this time. And at first it was hard, but I feel like we definitely grew a lot in that moment. And I think we appreciated moments from our past even that we had never truly gotten to appreciate. You know, Dan and I would sit down and have talks for, you know, an hour of just being like, man, we, we do need to appreciate, you know, what we've already gotten to do because we are the luckiest guys in the world to have ever been given this opportunity because just to say that we were about to do arenas and then it was pulled out from under us, just being able to say that is incredible and, and realizing that there is, you know, you need to find the positive in that of, you know, thank God that we got here. You know, we actually made it and we're able to be able to sell out these arenas and the people want to come see us and that in itself is a huge blessing and just very thankful to the you know, community that we had around us and our friends and our family for helping us get through that and, and figure out what life was going to look like in those moments in this last year and a half. And 
I think Dan and I maybe took like two months off of, of quarantining ourselves and then we got back together and it was, I think that first song we wrote was I Should Probably Go To Bed and that was just yeah. kind of where it started right there. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. What Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. You accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are. <laughs> 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 You guys were very productive. You, okay, we're down now. We got to do something. So you, totally. you dig in on this album. You already had a couple uh, songs written and done, as you say. But what was that process like different from what it had been like in the past? You've been writing songs together for nine, almost 10 years, I guess. What was it like over Zoom? Is the process different? I mean, I think you're used to being in a room together playing and, and working it out. What was it like to put good things together? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing quite like the camaraderie, being in the room with your friends, feeling that energy. You get on an idea or a song or you write a chorus and everybody's like jumping up and down. <laughs> but, you know, it was a learning curve at first to get on, you know, on a FaceTime or a Zoom and, and try to write a song. But I feel like it was good for us. I feel like it caused us to go back to the basics, how we used yeah. to write songs, just sitting there with a pen and paper and an acoustic guitar and really diving in deep on the idea. Because on Zoom, it's like only one person's talking at once, you know, and one person's face pops up on the camera. So whenever you got an idea, it really you had to really bring it, you know. It was like all eyes on you versus being in a right. room. People are talking, there's music playing, it's you know, it's high energy. You can get away with saying something you might not. Yeah. <laughs> no, nope, people said. just don't really react. They're exactly. Like, okay, that one didn't land, but that, it's like just you on the FaceTime and no one says something. It's pretty embarrassing. You got to gather your thoughts, man. So everybody was bringing their A game, and uh, man, I, I feel like we tapped into some of our best material just doing that. I mean, we were in our own world. You could put everybody on mute and kind of just dive in and focus on your own and be in your own space. And I think it was cool. And it was uh, then for us when we made the album and we recorded it, you know, luckily we've kind of always done that just on my laptop for better or for worse. I apologize <laughs> to the fans out there. I wish you guys would do it more pro. It's like, man, we just always did demos on my laptop. And that's kind of how we first got going. We were just two guys who love country music, moved to Nashville. We wanted to write country music, whatever that looked like, whether it was for ourselves or for other artists. and. We just did these demos, you know, whatever, playing whatever we could, just whatever guitar had a couple strings on it. And we would <laughs> put a demo down and then, you know, we started walking around town and people are like, we like these songs. Do you ever think about putting them out? And we're like, <laughs> I mean, maybe, I guess. Do you have a band name? I, I'm, I guess Dan and Shay, you know, and that's kind of how that came about. But I think uh, the fact that we had done that for so long gave us an advantage in this time where we could just kind of camp out in a guest bedroom in my house. I had a mattress, I got videos of it on my phone, you know, it's like, mattress leaning against the wall you know i'm pulling dog blankets you know out of the closet <laughs> laying them on the floor hey shay can you hold this pillow over your head you get the first vocal? perfect acoustic you know you would think at this point in our career four albums in i was yeah. like i should get a proper studio <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, feel, I got the best singer in the world here and he's like you know having to hold a pillow over his head to reflect the sound so it was uh it was funny man some good behind the scenes content on that but i, I think the fact that it's just the two of us in the room i mean putting our stamp on it I think that, you know, by the time it gets to the fans, they feel it, it's genuine, it's authentic, and it's us. You know, it's nobody telling us what we should sound like, what we should say, what we should do. Whenever it gets to the fans, it's, I, I feel like that's why these fans have connected with this album. I mean, it's just we left no stone unturned, man. We tried everything. You know, our fans deserve that. The people who have gotten us here deserve that from us. It was like, if we had an idea, we thought it was good, how do we make it great? How do we mm -hmm. flip that idea on its head or take the production, which 
may have been this direction or may have been this style and change it up a million times until we know that it's right. So I think you know, having all this time on our hands was just a bit of a silver lining to all of it. We really got to try everything and it felt like making a first album again. For, for, you know, it's like they say you have your whole life to make your first album. Then you got about two weeks to make every album right, after that. Right. <laughs> so it was like we never thought we would get that time to dig in again, and, and we did. And I feel like you know the music. We're so proud of it, man. It's uh, I think it's reflective of, of all the time that we spent on it. And you guys had such success with your last album three years ago with Tequila and and Speechless and all the hits that came off that. As you sat down for this album, did you feel like okay, we got some pressure on us now? People are gonna be waiting to see what we do next. Can we live up to that incredible monster hit? Absolutely. I'd like to say like, no, man, we didn't really even think about <laughs> it at all. Yeah. It was like, I mean, that's definitely staring you in the face. You yeah. know, when you have, and it's crazy to think that it has been three years, which I feel like in our minds, the last year and a half was kind of, we'll say two years since the record. Yeah. Because that just was, that was a long time. It was an asterisk. Yeah, it was an asterisk. But it was, uh, man, it, it, there definitely was pressure, but it was good pressure. I feel like the more that you build your career and, you know, I think that that is just has to be the standard. That has to be the, the bar that you reach for. You know, you're not always going to have the tequilas and the speechless songs so the 10,000 hours but we've our fans have continued to to help us grow and we try to listen to them of you know being out on the road helps a ton which is why this last year and a half was very difficult because you're out there you're playing songs we didn't get to play I should probably go to bed after it went number one we still haven't gotten to do that at our show yet and uh, that was a crazy thing because you can feel the songs reacting as you're playing them live I mean you can feel it as it's going up the chart there's a direct correlation between totally. what's going on kind of you know on the radio and just overall all the socials you can feel it kind of in that moment so it was definitely a a bar as we were trying to reach and we'd had I guess you know three number one singles off this record already which was you know a, as we were writing it we had had I guess two you know at that point and it was like man we really have to make sure that we're bringing our A game because if you don't I mean we're gonna these are gonna be standouts it's yeah. like yeah they had a couple of hits on there and then it seems like they might have quit halfway <laughs> through I'm not really sure what happened there but it was uh, no but it was a good process because I feel like everyone felt the pressure in a good way it was more of a uh, of an excitement of like alright we have you know, not having a bar would be a worse situation of like, yeah. all right, we have to figure out what a hit song sounds like. We have to figure out what our fans are going to like. And we had that bar that we could reach for, which is a huge help, I think, when you're writing an album. We can look at and, and know what our fans are going to want to hear and, and then kind of just be able to be genuine with it of like, all right, let's just kind of shoot for the stars on this and do everything possible that we can do. And luckily, unlike our last album since, I guess, the first one, we had the time to do that. Like Dan said, you, you don't have the time to truly put together you know, an album like that. And there's so much that goes into it that people don't think about. And we were on the road and trying to prepare for that and making a good show. And there's so many, and we're very hands-on with that. So we're like trying to design a stage and design you know, a, a tour and everything. So we never really had time to truly dive into an album. So this was a uh, very uh, welcome, you know, I guess it wasn't so welcome. We obviously did not want to go off the road, right. but it was a, a nice surprise to be able to have you know, the time to be able to work on that and really dig in. And, Dan could spend two months on a kick drum sound and EQing one little <laughs> sound. You know? and we could do that with the songwriting process as well. And that was just, it was a lot of fun because it, it did remind me of kind of those early years whenever we weren't trying to think too much into or trying to get in there and write great music, you know, something that we connected with. Because I think at the core of it, you know, songs that your, your fans are going to like, I think from that, those early years, we weren't thinking about like, okay, what are we gonna, we're just writing stuff that we love. Right. And we're just like, we love this. We were bumping it in my car and like <laughs> blowing out the speakers in my Jeep at you know two in the morning and just so excited about these songs that we had created and the magic that had happened since we got together. And I feel like that really translated on our first record and kind of continued you know that. And we're able to do that, especially on this record of just being able to sit down and kind of tell stories and, and talk with our co-writers and really dig into those songs and make sure that it was, it was purposeful and not just, you know, all right, we're gonna, try to do an album now we got a month here we go and so we were able to really dig in on that and just make sure that everything was was genuine in us and it was just it was a very very fun process and hopefully we don't have that much time again before we go out <laughs> on the road but uh it was it was a pretty awesome process for sure today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Boom. Boom. Ask your 
Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. You accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. So, Dan, you produce this Good Things record, right? And I understand you've got a checklist. Oh, yeah. As you go through... Like, this is how we're gonna make a great song. So what is your process when you're producing a record? Man, my brain is all over the place. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, social media, it's the live show, it's this, it's that, it's the, you know? And uh, I think, you know, for my mental health, like checklists have really helped me. And even as just mundane tasks, like, I know I'm gonna make a coffee first thing in the morning. I know I'm gonna make the bed. I know I'm gonna go for a run. So I put those things on the checklist every day. It's a little redundant, but when I check those off, you know, at the end of the day, I can look back and be like, oh, maybe I did accomplish something, you know? Cause I think you can get, caught in that cycle when you're making a record. You're yeah. just spending a lot of time on one thing, you know, EQing a guitar or dialing a drum sound, whatever it may be. And you look back on the day and you're like, I didn't accomplish anything. And then you get in your own brain and you, you feel like you, you know, slowed the process. But having that checklist, you know, gives me just an objective thing to work towards every day. And I just went old school, man, analog, like how records were made back in the day. You know, you had the board and it was like drums, bass, guitars, acoustics, piano, lead vocals, background vocals, and all those things just, I think it allowed me to, uh, to simplify the album process a little bit because it's daunting. To make an album, it's a lot of work. Uh, you know, not only us, but our entire team. It's like, there's album art, there's, now there's all these different platforms, you have to deliver something different to everybody, and it's, it's great. It's, you know, it means the music's getting out there, and it's nice that, you know, there are enough fans out there that are demanding the music that, you know, we have, I don't know, that, that we can, put different versions of songs yeah. and you know different videos out to different folks but it's a lot of stuff so I think you know at the beginning of the process it was like all right cool let's keep the focus let's let's draw this out and I you know as it started going as I was like checking away drums all right we're making progress here we, we almost have an album and it was uh yeah I, I, it was such a good feeling and it's never done I know anything in the creative process it's hard to say it's like it's done I've, I always tell this story but we had a song from the ground up on our second album Song was released before the album came out. It went number one, country radio was like double platinum, did its thing. And there were still like five little tweaks that I heard in there. I was like, ah, it drives me crazy. So every time it would come on the radio, no one would ever hear it. It was like a little, like the smallest little edit in a breath and a vocal. I was like, it always drove me crazy. If I was in the car, I'd be like, hey man, how's it? Uh, what's that? <laughs> you're you're driving I'm like, dude, no one hears that. I, <laughs> I, I could try here. to find, if you told me, find the things that bug me I, for a million dollars. I'd be like, I guess I'm not getting Honestly, that. when you're so <laughs> deep in it, it drives you crazy. But now I could probably not even go back and find the right. things. You right. get far enough disconnected from it and you forget about it. But, uh, you know, that I went back after the album or after the song had gone number one and I changed those things. So it was, I got it right on the album. So I felt good about that. It was a sigh of relief. Um, so you're a perfectionist. Yes, yeah. to a fault. Yeah, yeah, I'd say to yeah. a fault. <laughs> Shay, do you have a checklist too, or you just get in and you let know, it rip with your vocals? You know, my checklist, I did it for about a day, and then I realized <laughs> that it was making me feel worse about the things that I wasn't doing. Because there's just like one thing, it's just like, get up. I was like, well, I kind of did that. I was standing there with the kids for like an hour. If I didn't could sing like this guy, I wouldn't be a checklist. <laughs> what know? Dan didn't know about his checklist is I'd sneak in there every other day and I'd just erase one little thing. Oh, yeah, it was right. Venmo didn't know that. <laughs> Venmo <laughs> share, like, I haven't done that. Okay, That's why he has to follow all the things on the board. So I just sneak things in there. Totally. Like, it would yeah. probably work. It, just, it would probably work. I must work. have written this. Okay. Oh, I, I haven't done the checklist thing, but I, 
I do, uh, you know, I try to, to mentally do those things. I think it's a very good thing. I, Dan just, he does a lot more things than I do. <laughs> and so like, it would just not feel as good for my checklist. I'm like, got up with the kids, heard screaming for an hour and a half, you know, like <laughs> ate breakfast kind of at 11, you know. But no, it's, it's awesome. And I, I love being able to see the process too for him. It's like watching that from, you know, the outside perspective of, you know, when we sing the vocals and as the process is happening, you know, I was going over to his house a lot. And I mean, every time I'd go back and this, this guy, I mean, it's like, the thing was just filling up and I was like, we're gonna do this, dude, like it's gonna get done. And it was a really cool thing to, to see and I feel like that's a, the checklist thing has definitely been a, a, a nice process to watch. Yeah, that's right. Sure. It was like not fully committal though, it was dry erase. So at any point oh, I could be like, wipe it off. oh, I, yes. no, I, the drums aren't right. I can, <laughs> so I, next time I need to like do it in permanent yeah, ink or something. Yeah, get you a you know? Sharpie. For you still example. have that, right? You still, still have rocking, that. Yeah, and I was like, you gotta like, you have to put something over that. Like it would be so easy for someone to trip and then that part oh, of history is gone forever in a dry erase board. <laughs> It got tricky with the dry erase board. You like smudge it, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So I was right. hovering. Some of the uh, the X's on the board are a little sloppy. So <laughs> yeah. I got to redo those ones, make those more perfect. This oh, yeah. is the perfectionist. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. It's so interesting to hear you guys say that this process for this album was like going back to the beginning. Because I don't know if everybody knows, your fans do, but everybody knows the, your origin story, we'll call it, which is this now famous meeting at a house party in December of <laughs> oh. 2012 in Nashville. And then going back to your house where there was like a, tr uh, a fort of some kind in the living room. It's <laughs> probably a better way to put it. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that was. Tent. So what do you remember about that night, Dan, that really Man. led to all this? It's just the 10 year, you know, it's been 10 years since I moved to Nashville, which is crazy. Time flies. But I mean, moved to Nashville, loved country music, had a dream, didn't have any money to my name, you know, graduated college. All my friends went off and they were working jobs, making great livings, you know establishing a career and I'm like, I'm gonna go try to write songs and got, I had no money. It was like, found this house, had a buddy that I knew through a mutual friend who ended up becoming one of our best friends. And he's written, I think he wrote four songs on this album. So we've stayed friends ever since. And uh, man, it was just anything we could do to get by. And we had this house, we found it. It was like a hundred bucks a month in rent, which you, I don't know, you can't well, even get a meal for that. I'm sure I lived in that neighborhood at some yeah, point. Yeah, Barry Hill, man. Which okay. Barry Hill, yeah. 10 years later has come up. Yeah. It's cool, yeah. cool restaurants, cool bars. Sure. Not at the time, not, it was, no, uh, 10 years it was a little suspect. Yeah. But found this house and the heat didn't work, the AC didn't work, the locks didn't work on the doors, like a folded plexiglass <laughs> thing you could reach in. That's how you got in the it, house It is, but the, the keg in the back worked. There was a keg <laughs> that, that somebody <laughs> left over, probably a previous tenant, a keg of PBR, it was probably growing things on the surface, but hey, we were drinking it anyway. You had the important things covered. Exactly. The keg worked. Things were definitely yeah. I think the first time, so I came in, my, my friend Andrew, that I think I was living with actually at the time I was I think I was staying on his couch uh, my buddy Brandon's couch we all lived kind of together in this thing and he's like there's these these two guys that are uh, they're having a house party tonight a mutual friends of, of Dan and, uh, and our friend Andy who was talking about earlier and he was like let's go to this house party he's like you know they got a house over here in Berry Hill and, and they have a keg and I'm like I'm in I didn't even need to know the details I was like I don't need to know their character like they have a keg like I'm down let's go and none of us had any money. You know, it was like anytime there were going to be free drinks involved, we're like, I think we should really seize the moment here, guys. I think we need to do this. Sure, we haven't slept in a week. Let's go to this, yeah. this party. And uh, it was crazy. I, I walked in, and I remember getting to the house thinking, I don't know if I'm in the right house or not. 
because I got to the front door and I, the door was kind of like locked. And so I reached inside. <laughs> the window was kind of did like this. And I reached in there and I was like, this is either going to be a great time or I'm breaking and entering and I'm right. going to jail. Yeah. And at that point for the keg, I was willing to risk right. it all. Really. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going in. And so we went in there and I remember, you know, Dan and Andy and our, our guitar player now, Justin, was there at this party. And uh, it was just a... It was a great time. I think we ended up staying up till probably 2 a.m. And there was a moment where everybody was passing around the guitar and kind of playing their songs. And I was like, I'd like to take a crack at that. You wouldn't believe it. This guy hadn't said a word the entire night. Which <laughs> I, was too I, know busy on, I was too busy back at the keg. He, he's completely quiet and everybody's passing the guitar around Nashville style in this tent. We, we overlooked that detail. Yes, that's right. The we tent is in the living dude, room. I mean, we went to this place called Music City Thrift just down the road from where we live. We bought like six dollars worth of sheets. We tented it out. I mean, it was the only way we could stay warm. We had a little space heater. We huddled around wow. it, and wrote songs, whatever it took. And when he walked into the tent, he's completely quiet, like chilling, like this shy little guy hanging out. <laughs> shy guy. Yeah, <laughs> which I found out later is not the case. Yeah. You know, <laughs> We're all singing, and then it's like 2 in the morning. He's like, can I try one? And he starts singing, and I, I was like, everyone was like, oh, my gosh. This is the best, I, it was the best singer I ever heard in my life. Pulled out my phone. I still have the voice memo of this, and I like held it up. I didn't know what would come of this. You know, I didn't ever expect to be sitting here talking to you in New York City and all these crazy accolades behind us. But I recorded him. I was like, and I labeled it best singer ever. It was December seventh, <laughs> two thousand twelve. Right? Wow. Still, he was doing a cover, and uh, the next day I was just like, we need to write songs. Like we had both been chasing this dream separately obviously without much success. We wrote the next morning. I think it was like 7 a.m. Yeah. Don't know why. I think we were still up from the night before. Yeah. Wrote I would couple. say the next day, but I think it was that morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was the right. same it. day. Probably a better way to describe it. We wrote, we wrote two songs that day, and honestly, we haven't stopped. It was, it was insane. I mean, the first song we wrote, wrote got put on hold by a major artist, and it was like, man, up to that point, we couldn't get anyone to respond to an email or you know, take a meeting with us. We were sneaking into the CMT <laughs> Awards. We were doing all this madness. And then uh, from there, it was just like, it happened. It was like, it was meant to be. And I, one of the craziest stories about this is we didn't realize this till like a few weeks after we met. Shay had lived in Pittsburgh, like, I don't know, yeah. less than a mile from where I grew up. We didn't know each other. Oh, wow. Like, yeah, you went up it's there. It's pretty insane, man. I mean, it was like, I was describing like where I was like, yeah, I lived in Pittsburgh for a second. He was like, where at? Well, where at? And yeah. I was like, well, I was over here. It was like near Allison Park and all these places. And he was just like, yeah. He's like, that's where I grew up, yeah. like a mile. That's and it was just wild. kind of a crazy like, And how long whoa. were you there? I was there for about a year. Okay. About a year or a year and a half. Honestly, I don't, I'm not great with time yeah. nowadays. <laughs> really. Could have been seven years. I don't know. But I was there for about a year. And uh, I just remember like discovering that and thinking like, wow, that's probably, we were probably there at the same yeah. time. And you think about those things, man. You look back and you're just like, you know, those moments, thinking back to that house party, you never think that those are the moments that are going to kind of change your life. I mean, if there was one pivotal moment, I mean, that was it. Meeting Dan there in that house party, and I was just thinking that I was going to go for some free beer. So the moral of the story is always go to go the party. To the party. Yes. If there's free beer, always go yes. to the party if you're in Nashville. You got to go. Your life you philosophy go. really paid off. It did. Yeah. Okay, last question before I get you out of the greenhouse. Was there ever any consideration at the beginning of being Shay and Dan rather than oh, Dan yeah. and Shay? Dude, it's, it's a great question. I, yeah. I, I don't know how the name came about. It was always just like, we never set out to be a band. We were just two best friends writing songs. We would walk into a place, like a publishing, you know, somewhere that we were trying to get a free meal. Hey man, you want to take us out for lunch or a beer? <laughs> oh yeah, you've got a company card, let's go. Dan and Shay are Dan here. And Shay are here. Oh, Dan and Shay are here. So it was just like, that was the way it went. But now that I analyze it in reverse, it was like, maybe it was because if it was Shay and Dan, the word and ends with a D and then Dan starts with a D. So there's a little bit of gray area due to Shay and Dan. You gotta uh, like, it's, it's a little more difficult to say. It doesn't roll off the tongue as much having the D of Ann and the D of Dan back to back. We have a Dan whole chart written out if you really thought about yeah, that. You know what I'm saying though? We really dove into this. He's another got another one of checklist. Yeah, he's got another checklist. On the other side of that is, is a reasoning. <laughs> It, it also, Shay and Dan just sounds a little silly. I think it's a... See, exactly. Not, you you yeah. tied the two letters, the Shay two and Dan. there together. Shay, Shay and Dan. You're right. Basically like, cause it's there was, weird. Shannon Doe was already a band. So Dan and Shay was. It was everyone just called us Dan and yeah. Shay, and it was just kind of went from there. And also, we had had a couple band names that were absolutely atrocious that we will not talk about in front of the country, Willie. Come on. And uh, Come on. There was, I'll say one because it wasn't our idea. My, my lawyer one time, like early on, we had did this showcase thing, and he wrote down this thing thinking like, had an aha moment of like, guys, you might want to get over here because this is about to be. It took him ten minutes to type it on his iPad. It was too. it was kind of a peck situation where like and it, he clearly I mean it looked like he was writing a one thousand page document and he was just <laughs> writing this thing out and he has this big reveal and he kind of does this with the iPad and we're sitting there we're like oh, like things are about this to heat up it. dude this is like this is our future welcome you know and he flips it around and it says schools out 
<laughs> and Dan and I, we were just like, oh. you know, I mean, you should have seen the look on our faces. We didn't he know how to react. That day. That's crazy. Yeah, he, <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, yeah, so schools out did not make the Ooh. cuts. Dan and Shay, history was made. That's, That's right. Guys, thank you so much for doing this and for coming all the way from Nashville and sitting here with us on a hot Dude. summer day. You're the best. Thank you for taking thank the time, you. man. Thanks for joining us on Today All Day. Over in the next 30 minutes, I'll share some of my favorite interviews with you. These conversations include interviews with inspiring women, chatting all things books with a few of my favorite authors, and of course, some funny moments in between. So sit back and relax as Today All Day continues. So Jen, first talk to me about what it feels like to write this story, to write your story. I have to say I'm just flabbergasted that this book exists because the stories in this book I never told anyone or even replayed in my own head until I got to a point where I said I have to write this book and so before starting to put pen to paper I of course had to go to a lot of therapy <laughs> and process everything and relive things and cry a lot and laugh a lot um, and it was really hard to write the sad moments, of which there are a few. So I started with writing the happy moments. The first time, my first time eating pizza, <laughs> my dad scrimping and getting me a Tamagotchi that I thought I would never be able to have in my hands, um, getting my cat for the first time. And that kind of opened up, I don't know, this back room of my heart where I stored up all of these memories that are so heavy and that I was told you know, not to talk about because of the shame of, mm -hmm. of having been quote unquote illegal. Tell me what it was like coming here. Sure, um, at age seven, I moved here with my mother, followed my father to America, which in Chinese, the name for it is Meiguo, which translates directly to beautiful country. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing about that is that back then in China, no one had a real understanding of what America was like. So my uncle said, oh, the streets are paved with gold. You'll be so rich. And my grandma said, you're going to be shot dead on the street. They're really mean to Chinese people. So I had zero knowledge of what it would be like, except through the limited drabs and drips from my father during our phone calls, because he had arrived two years earlier. And when we stepped foot out of JFK was when I realized that my life was going to be completely different. It was a distinctive before and after. In China, I was just a normal kid, running around, screaming, dancing, playing with friends and family. And in Meiguo, America, I was to stay quiet and not be noticed at all. And also, your expectations, your uncle saying the streets are lined with gold, was very different than the childhood you yes. lived. I mean, you lived in extreme poverty. You were hungry. It was not the life of, of plentiness that I had come to expect. But at the same time, there were these little joys, like cheese. Everywhere I went smelled like cheese. I remember that being a distinctive smell of America. Um, cheese and the smell of subways, which is very different. <laughs> <laughs> Eating pizza um, and having a wealth of books before me was, there must have been libraries in China, I'm sure of it, but I don't remember being in a room just full of books and just feeling so rich in, in, in the worlds before me. And then having that juxtaposed with going to school hungry and seeing my mother work for cents at a time um, really gave me a sense and understanding that there were indeed two Americas out there and that both descriptions were accurate depending on your perspective. You write about landing here in America and I love it so I'm going to quote it. I ascended yeah. to adulthood at cruising altitude which was a metaphor for leaving the people that you loved, leaving the, the life that you knew, leaving your culture and landing in America. And you really did go from being a child to an adult in a matter of, of blight. <laughs> um, what was that like? Talk to me about your early years here. I do think a lot about my parents coming here at 31, barely 30, yes. and having such vivid, real memories of what it was like to be a professor in China and then being here and working at a sweatshop or working at a sushi factory and how as an adult from an adult perspective 
how very painful it must have been. For a child, you know, I got here and I just assumed everyone in America was kind of hungry all the time and children had to stay quiet a lot and they went to work with their parents and helped out snipping thread at the sweatshop and I just assumed that some, everyone here had some variation of that because children, I think, just tend to assume that their experiences are normal and I think that helped me a lot. Right, because then I wasn't editorializing, I was just doing whatever was put in front of me. Um, but it was confusing too, because in China I had never ever been alone. My grandparents were there, my uncles were there. Um, and being here and just being with my parents and being so dependent on them and then them being so different given the new demands of life that I couldn't, I was not equipped at all to understand um, was was really difficult and then not speaking English felt like I was walking through a fog every day of my life until I started to piece together words and being like okay that's that's what that word means make the most of your day with today in 30 we give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you what you must know the biggest moments of the morning one republic Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are. <laughs> <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I love where you write about your early childhood, that it was joyful that you were kind of the mayor of your class that all the little girls came to you to ask what you thought they should do <laughs> and then you came here to um, a school where you didn't speak English they put you in a classroom really all by yourself being put in that classroom by myself though helped me because you know there were books around and I found my friends in those books and found a real refuge in those books it just opened up brand new doors for me and, and it really got the sense from my father too that literacy was the way out of poverty and that was a message that I internalized really early on. Yeah, I yeah. loved the scene where you first found Clifford, the big red dog, yeah. and then it was the girls from the Babysitter's <laughs> Club and Sweet Valley High who became these companions that you didn't have yeah. and they really opened up a world. Yep. And I know that you love Babysitter's Club. Yes, I love I Babysitter's mean, Club. <laughs> <laughs> For years after, I kept trying to start a club and doing some sort of, you know, <laughs> some gardening. Yeah, yeah, something. It didn't work. But, but that idea of loyalty and friendship and belonging and also understanding what America was like outside of New York City, mm -hmm. outside of the inner city, it really opened my eyes up to, oh, like in a place in Connecticut, there's grass and lawns and people walk to school with their friends and their school buses. And it was a world where my biggest concern was doing my homework and getting to my baby babysitting job. Like I fully pre pretended that I was one of the babysitters um, and it just felt so safe. Yeah. yeah. You know, that safety is a word that I kept thinking about because as an undocumented child, your life was filled with fear. Even when your mom was so sick that you had to call 911 or she possibly could have died, right. you were scared to pick up that phone. Yeah. Talk about the fear and what it's like to be a child under that fear. I think children pick up a lot of the emotional energy of their parents and their households. So for me, it was almost, I didn't, I didn't think of it, you know, 
consciously as fear. It was just soaking up whatever my parents were sending my way. And I just learned to be extremely cautious, to turn and look over my shoulder. If there was someone in uniform, anyone in uniform, even a sanitation worker, I would pivot and walk the other way. It just became ingrained in me that caution was number one. Number two was not being noticed at all, not seeking out the resources. And that's an issue I'm sure millions of undocumented people still deal with today, um, you know, even with, with getting the vaccine. When I went to get my shot recently and they asked me for my ID, my first instinct was to pivot and run. It was, it was just like that. And it was that childhood instinct, I think, never leaves you. And you can talk to it and soothe it and, and have it take its place where, where it belongs. But I think it will always be somewhat a part of me. There's a scene in this where your mom says, I've published two books. I'm a published author. And then she comes here to work for pennies in sweatshops. What was that like to witness your parents go through that? It was really difficult. It made me want to protect her at an age where I did not know how. At the same time though, both my parents still carried the sense of dignity and pride. And it came not in the form of, I'm not going to do this work, it's beneath me. It's not, it's not that kind of pride. It was, I will do this and I will overcome this and this is not going to stop me. And my mom, you know, every night before going to the sweatshop would put curlers in her hair as if she was going to the university to teach. She would dress as nicely as we could possibly afford to, to do. And she, she kept her head held high and that was what gave me hope that her spirit was not broken and as bad as anything got as hungry as I got my mother always said it's temporary and and I think that perspective that she had from having been in China and having seen the heights of, of China and then coming down here and see, seeing the lows of America kind of gave her the perspective that nothing is permanent as long as you can um, keep your head up and keep moving forward so I, I, don't, I don't think I could have asked for more inspiration than seeing my mother go through that. How did you get through some of the hardships as a seven-year-old? The books were a huge part, just throwing myself into reading. And in part, at the be in the beginning, it was just a matter of practicality. My dad said, if you speak English without an accent, you'll be accepted and you'll be an American and people won't question where you're from and when you moved here, maybe they wouldn't suspect us of being undocumented. So that was my goal, just to be as fluent as any white person. But I just found myself loving these books. The other was teachers. I mean, I had teacher Miss Pong mm -hmm. in third grade. She was just inspired so much in me. I mean, she gave me Charlotte's Web, which I still have to this day. but. She just gave me the sense of home and warmth. And I think that's what happens to immigrant children when they move far away from family, is that you, you tend to find family figures everywhere. You applied on your own as a young girl to a talented and gifted middle school, even when your teacher said, like, that's not possible. What, where, where did that come from? I think my ignorance at the time really helped. I didn't had no idea of the students I would be going to school with or that I was competing against to get into school. Um, and I had no idea how behind I was. Like, so I just assumed, okay, people, that girl has a Tamagotchi, that girl has a Barbie doll. They have a little more than me, but I assume they live in the same exact type of home that I did. And that really helped me because I was a little bit blind to everything else that I was competing against. Um, and I think in life, it probably helps to be a little bit foolish uh, because you never know. And then you went on to graduate from Yale Law School. What was that moment like? Surreal. I could not believe it was happening. Much like this book, I cannot believe it's happening. It's, you know, I have to say that I also have a lot of privilege, right? My parents were educated in China and that helped me a lot, even if they didn't have the jobs that educated people necessarily have in the U.S. The way they thought about things, the way that they cultivated reading and thinking um, and debating at home 
really helped me and set me forward. And I have a lighter skin color than most people of color. That has helped me. And I don't have an accent by no, I mean, there are children who come here at the same age as me and they have an accent. I, I, it's inexplicable to me why I have these privileges. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. And what do you think it meant like when you were walking across that stage? Did your mom did her story, did her staying up late at night studying even while she was suffering with the sickness? Did, um, did you picture her and the other women who were working in freezing temperatures, cutting sushi or sewing buttons? Oh. Did their stories come to your mind? For sure. And not just when I walked across the stage with a mortar board. It followed me all seven years of higher education. When I got into college, I was thrown into a different world. I had no idea that schools like Andover existed, for instance, or people like to ride horses. I just had no insight into that world. And I felt so lonely and it was incredibly difficult emotionally. I was also working four or five jobs throughout college. And there were days when I wanted to give up, but then I remembered my mother sitting at that sewing machine for three cents a piece sewing labels onto each piece of clothing after she had published textbooks and was a respected professor of math. And I said, if she could do that, I can do this. I mean, this is nothing to complain about. And it's, it's funny because there's this whole narrative in American discourse about Asian parents being really strict and pushing children. My parents were the complete opposite of that. So there's a, a famous term, tiger mom now. I think of my mom as the panda mom because in high school she gave me a stack of sick notes and she said just use it whenever you want just whenever you want to skip school I don't I don't care when just do it and my dad would call me when I was in college Saturday nights and I'd answer of course because I'd be working or studying he said why aren't you out at a party I don't hear any music in the background go to par go to a party any party and I was like I don't want a party he's like just go <laughs> <laughs> they, I, they probably wanted the, the fun and the freedom yeah. and that maybe wasn't afforded to them and they're, when they arrived here. Do you feel like that's what it was? For sure. And I think they carry a lot of guilt about uh, my childhood. My dad gave such an impassioned speech at my wedding in 2019. I had never heard him say these words before because, again, we never acknowledged those years. It just was not talked about. And he said she had a really difficult childhood and if we could do it over we would do everything completely differently and that just broke my heart because they gave me everything they possibly could have 
um, given the very limited resources they had. And I think if, if nothing comes from this book, but for them to feel a sense of healing and forgiveness for themselves, that would be my biggest dream come true. And have they, have they read it? I have not allowed them to yet. <laughs> <laughs> they have been asking, but I just, um, you know, they're still afraid. My, my mother's a citizen, my dad is, has a green card. They still think ICE is going to come after us. And uh, that trauma really stays with you. And there are moments when I think, what am I doing? I'm going to get all of us deported. We're all just going to get deported because of me. And I was foolish. I was a little too foolish this time. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning. Welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are <laughs> bad <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with... Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Some experts say that this bill still isn't enough. Do you accept that criticism? There's been a ton of confusion from the CDC. Can we try to clear some of this up? Is America safer today with the Taliban in charge of Afghanistan? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. And you've said before that this is your story, but it's the story of so many others. And that it was a story that you were ashamed of, that you didn't even tell friends. And after um, the election in 2016, you decided that you could no longer stay silent. That that voice that said, you must stay silent, you must not take up space, went away. Yeah, that's right. And I think the timing of the 2016 election really woke me up because I had become a citizen just four months before in May. And I remember walking to the courthouse and being sworn in and then President Obama was on a video screen and said, my fellow Americans, and those words just meant so much to me, to be called an American was not something I even thought about as needing. But when it was said to me by the President of the United States, it gave me a validation that I had been searching for for 30 years. And then when the election came and the national discourse just took a real turn, I found myself for the first time to be in a position of real privilege. And it's true what they say, as I'm sure you know and you've lived, Jenna, that with privilege comes a lot of responsibility to speak up for those who aren't able to. And I finally felt safe to share this story and not worry about ice banging down my door, although sometimes I still have that thought. But I know that there are people out there who cannot do that. And it was then no longer my story or my choice to keep it a secret. This is bigger than me. And that message came to me loud and clear mm -hmm. after that, that 2016 election. You know, there's something super powerful about the fact that you found a life in books. You found friends and places you maybe never got to even visit. And now <laughs> your life is written about in this book, that you get to share your story when for so many years you were told not to share who you were, yeah. that it was shameful even who you were. There's something really beautiful about that. You're right. I hadn't thought about it that way. But as you were saying that just now, I was thinking 
that Southern California always felt like a second home to me because the Sweet Valley twins, <laughs> Elizabeth and Jessica Wakefield, <laughs> live there. And I just feel a natural connection to that place. And I do hope that people through my book will feel a real connection to New York City, to Brooklyn, to Manhattan, to the magic of Fifth Avenue during the holidays. Mm -hmm all of these little unique New York moments, even on the subway and in Chinatown, um, that, that it can bring New York City to life for them like the Sweet Valley Twins mm -hmm. did for me for California. Mm -hmm. and it did for me, it was so fun to read about yeah. that and how your parents found these little moments of joy amidst the m hardship for you, like, the, like your mom taking you to see those holiday windows yeah. and the magic of New York. Um, I wonder what you would. I wonder what you would say to your seven and eight year old self. I would tell her that it is not her fault, because I think it's really human nature, but especially natural for a child to blame herself for everything. That if there's a shift in your parents, if they don't, no longer all of a sudden have time for you when before they had all the time in the world to play with you and make you a kite and fly it with you and then now they just don't even have time to talk to you, you think you did something wrong. It's, it's completely natural. So reminding her that it's, it's not her fault and reminding her as, as my mother did, so I need to say this less, you can get through this and you will. Mm -hmm. There is another side to it. I, um, I think most people would think that when you got those prestigious degrees, you were living the American dream. Were you and are you now? I definitely was not. I think it's very dangerous when you get everything you work for materially because you all of a sudden become aware of everything that is lacking mm -hmm. emotionally, psychologically. I was so divorced from who I really was from the child I was, everything that came naturally to me, all my natural instincts were tamped down because I had to be cautious and I had to keep everything a secret. And I just, I remember, you know, going to work in this fancy office with my fancy briefcase and suit and coming home to this fancy apartment in Manhattan, looking myself in the mirror and just not knowing who I was. I had everything that the American dream told me that I was to go for and it wasn't enough, then what else is there, right? What, what is the key? And it took me a lot of time, a lot of therapy, a lot of thinking and reading my old diaries and crying to understand that real success is not material wealth, which is so easy to easily portrayed as in American culture. Of course, it's easier to find the su success I'm thinking of, which is a connection to your true self when you are not worrying about money, right? But that's, that's necessary but not sufficient. For me, the American dream that I'm living now is being really honest about who I am. I'm the same person here as I am at home. I feel I can finally say no shame mm -hmm. about my childhood. I feel only love for that child who was hungry and sad and sometimes a little petty. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel, I, I, I cried with her, I laughed with her, and I feel a closure, both a closure and a connection to my childhood. And understanding that my childhood has really shaped who I am deep down and continues to guide me. And most of all, that my instincts are to be listened to, that they are the thing that guides me to where I'm supposed to be in life. And that I would have, could have never dreamed for myself because I didn't know that was a thing to do, nor could I have understood that I would be able to find this beauty. So writing this book itself has been, for me, how I define it, the real American dream. Yeah, this right here yeah. is the dream. Yeah. Even if it hadn't been published, and I'm lucky that it is, and it's, you know, it's, it's being received. If I had just written that story, if I had been able to get to a place emotionally, psychologically, to live those experiences again, heal through those experiences, and write this down, just to pass it down to my children and grandchildren, that would have been the American dream.
Hey Today All Day. We've got a great show for you on this Thursday morning, including an all-day exclusive chat you can only see here. But let's kick it off with Pop Start. We check in with Carson, who has all the buzzy headlines. Plus, he's got some special guests joining him this morning. Check it out. Best time of the morning. Oh, time Pop Start. Now. Oh, Pop yeah. Start. Oh. And look. Come on, look Pop this. Start bonus take going that. on. Woo. Look at that show. Look at this. <laughs> We're nice Pop and start. close and cozy. Well, let's say good morning to Michelle Hargitay <laughs> and Christopher Maloney, everybody. Yeah. We have some yes. special guests. Come on, we're talking about tonight's premiere of Law & Order, SVU, and Organized Crime. But first, let's get to some other pop start headlines. It's good to have you two here. We're going to start with Saturday Night Live. Why? Well, because the start of season 47 is just around the corner, and the iconic shows announced the upcoming lineup of hosts and also musical guests. It's going to be kicking things off next month. Leading the season premiere is going to be Owen Wilson and musical guest Casey Musgraves. Oh, that's going to be good. That'll be October 2nd. Yep. The following week's host, when everybody seems to be talking about this morning, oh. Kim Kardashian West. Oh, my. The reality star and businesswoman tweeting a photo of the announcement yesterday writing no turning back now huh. luckily Kim's gonna be with an SNL veteran for her first time hosting musical guest Halsey set oh, yeah. to take the stage in studio 8h for her fourth time Rami Malek mm -hmm. musical Love guest him. young thug they're mm -hmm. gonna join the show October 16th Craig you look perplexed mm -hmm. that's, that's quite the pair <laughs> finally yes. SNL alum this would be a big one recent Emmy winner Jason oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Oh. that'll be huge returning to the show as host Ooh. musical guest Brandy Carlisle oh, oh that's a good one now the only oh. question we have is who from the cast will be back <laughs> when the season kicks off next month stay okay. tuned mm -hmm. for more on that <laughs> we yeah. turn to our special guests here Mariska and Christopher it's been 22 years oh. since wow. we first met them on Law and Order's special victims unit. Now Captain Benson and Captain Stabler are fighting crime, but in different units, but never far apart. He just guys. laughed. Because he's not a captain. I'm the captain. Uh, uh, well, yeah. so he's, he's a, a promoted. detective. Yeah. He's a promoted. Guys, yeah, Let's guys. just keep it real. Can we, can we get to the most important yeah. piece? Yeah. The, the chemistry question has been yeah. brought up all morning. It, and there was a picture. How do you mean? There's a picture that you guys yeah. put out there, or somebody did. It was hotness. There was something happening. You're teasing us. Can we show the picture and can you tell us if there's a love connection? Oh, no. Okay. No. It must be. Is it on in this new season, season? After all these years, you've been making us wait. I don't for know if I want to know the make out. You know yeah. what it is? Our eyesight just got so bad. So the <laughs> is that you? Is that, is that you? Oh, hey. Oh, hey. <laughs> you said I love you at the end of last season. Yeah. Did I? I saw it. I was under a, a, a emotional duress. duress. Yes, I. Yeah, oh, I did. And, and you did. Is. Yeah, but you know that was only because I, I was saying it because it, it was in, in the midst of an intervention. My oh. family was coming together with the help of uh, Olivia Benson uh, mm -hmm. for an intervention, that and was. one of my daughters said, "I I love you," mm -hmm. but I was looking at Mariska. So how could you oh. not? It just comes natural. I love there you. you. I love you. Oh. Oh. See what I mean? What was this chemistry oh. like this in the 90s when you screen tested for this back in yeah. the day? Just, Immediately, right? Immediately. Really? Yeah. It's, um... And based on comedy, really. Truly. It, it, it was an instant, instantaneous um, connection that is inexplicable, that has only grown. Hmm. And, um... I, I look at it as a gift, but the second we met, it was like. Did you guys ever date for real? Since you were both probably for four single? years, mm -hmm. and we just broke up two, two months ago. <laughs> don't tell um, our spouses. Don't tell our spouses. <laughs> before, before wow. everybody, no. No, we no. met at the screen test. Yeah. Um, she was an LA girl. I was a New York okay. guy. Okay. Yeah, but you guys work. met at the screen test. Do you feel like your chemistry is kind of how you both got the roles? Yeah. Like. You, you, that worked so well. The producers were like, "Oh, we well, get ones, one, buy one, one get one free." Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I always say that we went in, and I was telling her a story that had a good, nice finish punchline, and uh, I had to. I told them, "Could you hold on one second? Because I wanted to finish the story." So there are all the suits going. What are you doing? What You're telling us to wait. Here. But, yeah. but when I walked in, I sort of scanned it and I went, that's the guy. That's the guy. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Savannah compared it to uh, Moonlighting. Remember this with yeah. Bruce yeah. and Bruce Yeah, Bruce. we were all rooting we for, were, we for wanted Bruce and yeah. Sybil Shepard to yeah. get together. Yeah. So, well, listen, there's so much love and there's so much trust and try. there's so much ease and there's so much chemistry. And the gift of it is that it is truly stood the test of yeah. time. Yes, it, it has. has. Well, it's cool because now you've come back, okay, because yeah. I'm sure you were so sad during this was, time when he was yeah. gone, and now you have this whole new law and order mm -hmm. world, organized, right, organized right. crime, right. but the world lives also in the SVU yeah. world, there's the crossover, yeah. Yeah. which yeah. is fun. Yeah. yeah, a little cross-pollination there. I love yeah. that, yeah. like when Laverne would show up on the Happy Days, remember? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, what? Yeah. Organized yeah. crime, by the way, Shirley's I watched the entire season Richie. last year. How's that it's awesome? a solid show. Thank you, yeah. It's a solid show. Yeah, It's a little different way of telling the story than Law and Order is used to, but I think, you know, that was their marching orders of, you know, 
know, we're going to have more of a serialized. We get to tell the story over eight episodes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think mean, we're going to have through those. I know you hurt your, you broke your ankle. I did. You know, yeah. uh, which is, I mean, my gosh, that's that's one of the toughest injuries going. How, how are you doing? Oh, thank you for asking. It's so funny because I'd love to say like, oh, you should see the other guy. But the truth <laughs> of the matter is, I tripped yeah. in the rain walking yeah. across the street. Um, I'm feeling great. I'm feeling bionic now because yeah. after I had surgery, I had two plates oh, and 13 like pins. Oh, we yeah. all had to keep it under wraps. You're slowing everybody it, up at JFK now. It is truly, <laughs> and it, it, um, it was one of those things where it happened a couple of weeks before we started shooting. Yeah. Uh, so our amazing Wait, writers. Did you see the Melissa McCarthy video? What, I did. What, was going, what did you think when you saw that? Well, first we of have all, that? I'm her biggest fan. Yes. She's the greatest thing going. Yes, hey. yes. But she's so funny and so, um, it was so generous and so honoring and so funny. And mm. I was here trying to keep it under wraps and then she was like, ah! <laughs> she put, I don't know if we showed it. She no, went out no, on the street yeah. with a video with a sign saying, honk, honk if you're praying for, your for Mariska Harkin. Right. It was crazy. So cute. Lots of honks. Yeah. But, uh, but anyway, they, our great writers, Julie Martin and Warren Light, had to you know, rewrite oh, the, 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 the script and put it in there. Oh my God. Well, did they write in that you had a broken ankle? They did. You'll just have to Watch tonight. Okay. Will, you, will you at least answer this? Do you know whether you're going to get together this season? You're just not telling, or do you honestly not know? I don't know. Oh. Really? Yeah. No, yeah. we're really. It's, okay. it's all it's, it's, underneath it's, percolating, oh, and we're so trying many. to right now after Stabler being gone for yeah. ten years, yeah. uh -huh. and the way that he left, and the complexity of what's yeah. happened in and the last ten years, and how I came years, back, and how he yes. came back, surprising me. We're still finding our way. Okay, wow. but it's um, complex and real, and I think what I loved about it most is that it's earned. Oh. Right, oh, this relationship is truly earned. Okay. Not a lot of people oh, a have a 23-year yeah. yeah. relationship. Well, that's why everyone's right. rooting for it to right. happen. Yeah. Yeah. It should never happen. No. What? what? Right, because like in Moonlighting, the minute it happened, yeah. then it it's was over. like, oh. Yeah. No, no, no. Sam and Diane, I disagree with Carson. Raise your hand if it should happen. Percolating, 23 Definitely. years. Yes. You can vote. Oh, he said oh, I love What do you guys have? Oh, you don't think it should happen? Or you're not abstaining from the vote? We're, We're not, not allowed, allowed to vote. vote. You're, abstaining. you're abstaining. Yeah. Oh, there's a poll. We got a poll. We polled our viewers. What do they want? Oh, slides. Wow. Yes. Oh, my God. America wants it. Let's what do a deep sure. dive into that. We're Steve Kornacki on the big board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, can, I, can I say something about yeah, sure. today yeah. that's so amazing? I mean, we're sitting here, and it's our 23rd year. It's premiere day. And today, we are starting to shoot our 500th. Episode. Yes. Congratulations. Yeah. So it Congratulations. really is a milestone. Yeah, yeah, a handful. So. Just so grateful yeah. and profound. And well, that's earned too. Yeah. This yeah. love for this show and these characters. Yeah. Thank so. you so right, much, guys. Christopher and Mariska. We'll see you tonight. Back-to-back -to -back season premieres of Law and Order, SVU, and Organized Crime, starting at eight Eastern, seven Central, right here on NBC. We're back after this. Coming up next on Today Talks, everything you need to know about making some extra dough after this. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Good morning, welcome to you today. Nice to have you with us. We wanted to surprise Ellie and make her wish come true. What do you think about coming to visit us? Yes. There's only one thing that people are saying. Like, you are. <laughs> 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 Welcome back. Today on the third hour, a complete guide on how to sell all your stuff online. Folks, it's time to cash in while you declutter. Check it out.
Time now for our Consumer Confidential Guide to Selling Your Stuff Online. This morning we have tips and websites to help you declutter and make some extra cash at the same time. NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn is here with the details. Vicki, good to see you. Hi, good morning. So, good good morning. to see you too. So, so I got to imagine, that, you know, I, you know, I drive around and you see all these tag sales, but I would think during the pandemic, or people kind of like hands-free sort of stuff, mm -hmm. that this has had to explode it online. The online resale market is bananas right now. It's not just eBay and Amazon anymore. In fact, it is exploding in growth, and um, there's a company called OfferUp. They're big on secondhand stuff online. They're predicting that next year we're going to see an explosion in terms of how many people. This past year, 48% of Americans bought something secondhand mm. online. Wow. 48%? Yes. ThreadUp, which is also in this space, says in five years it's going to be a $77 billion industry. Wow. So it's a great way to make money and to save money. Mm -hmm. Let's start with clothes. I can't wait to post my maternity clothes yes. somewhere online. I mean, how, do, how does it work with clothes? How can you make the most of it? Yes, this is so important. So I